Well, good morning. My name is Tyler Jagan, pastor of Spiritual Growth, and um, we're in the second week of this series called Transformed. If you weren't here last week, let me kind of catch you up. Uh, it's all about just what that word means. Transform means change, but, the, but it's more than that. That word, uh, the prefix to that word transform, trans means to actually come across, to go to the other side. So the idea here is not just a, a small little change, it's a huge come over to the other side kind of change. And it's those kind of changes that we all would love to see more and more in our lives. If we're dealing with, with financial issues and problems, we would love to go to the other side of that problem and find freedom and peace from those things. If you're dealing with, with health issues and things of that nature, I know you would love to be on the other side of that and be able to feel your body whole and be what it was supposed to be like. If if you're dealing with uh, relational issues and some relational hurts and some anxiety and, and stress that comes from that, there's no doubt that you would love to be on the other side of that. So the idea of transform is to move from one place to a completely different place. It's kind of the idea of a, a transatlantic flight. It means to go across the Atlantic. You are on one side of the Atlantic and now you're on the other side. And so this idea of change is to go from being on one side to a completely different side of it. Now, when it comes to change, oftentimes what we think about change is we want to know how we need to change, or we, need to, we, we want to know what do I need to do to change. But that's the wrong question to ask at the outset, because you can ask the what and how all day long, and if that's all you ask, you won't see the change or the moving across to the other side of whatever area of your life that you're dealing with. You won't see it, because Transformation, change, doesn't start with the what, nor does it start with the how. It starts with the question, the most important question is the who. The who is the person behind your life that is influencing you. Most of the areas that you are stuck in is stuck because of a who or someone who is speaking into your life that's basically saying this is what will make your life happier, this is what in life would make you more fulfilled, um, or it's, it's the who behind you who's getting you stuck by saying you'll never measure up, you'll never succeed, you'll never be happy. There's always a who behind the, where we get stuck, but there's also a who behind how we transform, how we change. In fact, it's not so much of, of moving from, you know, one habit to being fulfilled with another habit or a different habit. It's actually, it's moving from li listening to a certain person or a certain group of people to listening to someone else. Let me give you an example of this. When God created us, he said, it's very good. It's very good. Okay? Everything was wonderful. Everything was great. And then we changed, but we didn't change with a what or a how. Before there was a what and a how to that change, there was a who. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, there is a person, a deceiver, who began to speak into the hearts and the minds of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and began to speak into them uh, a different type of influence into their lives. And through that, basically, that influence in their lives, they transformed. They moved from being in the very presence of a very good, loving God by which they, they experienced the, the perfectedness of what God always de desired for us. They listened to another voice, and so what they did was they moved away from God, and they came, and they moved to another, you know, relationship or another voice and began to listen to that voice. A voice that basically said, you know what, God doesn't have your best interests in mind. God doesn't know what he's talking about. In fact, he's keeping you from joy and, and purpose and meaning and purpose and fulfillment in your life. And they bought into it. And for ever since, we've bought into the same thing. That basically here we are, we're, we are a group of people, a society around the world, we're all the same. That basically moved from a position of being intimate with our God to being separate from him through the listening of ourselves and other people other than God. There are two reasons why we stay stuck. And there's two reasons why we don't see transformation in our lives. And the first reason why we get stuck, or the reason 
why we stay stuck is, is first and foremost, we got to understand that you and I, all of us, every single person in this room, every single one of us around the world, we by nature, we are selfish. We're selfish. And so when we think about ourselves, who do we listen to? Listen to what we listen to ourselves. This is what I want. This is how I, I want my life to be. This is how it should be. This is how I, you know, I want my life to be like. And then guess what we listen to? Who else? We listen to others. And who are other people? It's us. And who are we? We're selfish too. Oftentimes we will tell people, you know, our opinions and thoughts, even if we don't really necessarily really believe whether we're right or not. Why? Because we're selfish. We want people to think we're smart, right? And not only that, but we'll tell people things too because we want them to like us. Why? Because we're selfish. So we get ourselves into this place by which we just kind of stay stuck. We don't really see a lot of change in our lives because we're selfish and we listen to other selfish people. And so we stay stuck. Our, our condition is, is nothing new. Uh, we love, in the, in, the, in the age of technology, we, in the age of enlightenment and education, we, we like to think that we are smarter than anybody who's ever gone before us. And that may be true with understanding some of the things about nature and mathematics and technology and things like that, but we are the same. You go know, 2,000 years ago, and you look and you read society, yeah, maybe they dress differently, maybe they have some different cultural stuff that they did and all those sort of things, but they were exactly the same. And there was a guy named Paul who was a follower of Jesus Christ who spoke into that and spoke into why humanity is stuck the way that it's stuck. And Paul wrote this letter to a group of Christians in Romans. And if you have your Bible, why don't you flip over to Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 21. If you don't have it, we'll have the verses up here so you won't, you know, get lost here. But what you see here is within the problem of humanity is this just issue of a couple of things, and one of those things is selfishness. So Paul writes, he says, yes, they knew God. Who's the they? It's humanity. He's just talking about people in general. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship as God or even give him thanks. Why would they not give God thanks? Well, because they're selfish. We tend to live our lives, you know, maybe giving a little bit of a cordial thank you to God, or especially if we're dealing with a crisis or things like that, and he gets us out of that, we give him a little thank you. But oftentimes, we don't really live our lives in a way that really honors him, worships him, and truly gives him thanks for all the amazing, wonderful things it has for us. We want more. Why? Because we're selfish, all right? So they didn't even give thanks to God, and they began to think up of foolish ideas of what God was like. Can we do that today? Can we think of foolish ideas about God even today in the 21st century, even though, you know, we're, we're really smart and intelligent and we, you know, have all this education? Can we do that today? You bet we can. Absolutely. Have you, have you heard, you know, or maybe come out of your mouth or the mouth of somebody else who just said, you know what, this is who I think God is. Well, I don't think God's like that because my God doesn't, isn't like that. This is my God. You know, this is what I think. This is what I think. Or maybe you've heard people say, well, you know what, everybody has a different interpretation of Scripture, of what God is. What does that mean? That just means we all have our own foolish ideas of what God, who God is. So we all have our own interpretations. We all have who we think God is. And at the core of that, if we dig a little bit deeper, is a selfishness that desires to have a God that we can manipulate for the way that we want him to be. Okay? And we make a mess of it. And so as a result, Paul says... As a result of that, we're just all lost when it comes to truly understanding who the real God is and what he really, really is all about. As a result, their minds, it's humanity, this is us. This is us too. Our minds became dark and confused. And so we became confused. We moved from clarity, okay, in the presence of God, with God. We listened to other voices, deception, deceiver, our own deceptive voices, Voices of other human beings who are also broken and imperfect. And now we've become confused. Confused about God, confused about us, confused about how this whole thing is supposed to work, confused about how we're supposed to change. And so selfishness confuses us. But Paul goes on and he says this, But claiming to be wise, okay, us, humanity, because we all like to think we're all smart, don't we? We all love to think that, man, we are so wise and so amazing. You know, that's why we love watching Jerry Springer, because when we watch Jerry Springer, we go, man, I feel really smart, because those people got lots of issues. 
So claiming to be wise, they, became, they instead became utter fools. I remember back when I was in uh, a freshman year, my freshman year in college, my and I, we went out into the, this field and we just kind of leaned back, we looked into the stars and we began to pontificate about all the world's problems and issues and, and why we have it all figured out and everybody's a bunch of idiots except for us. And, and we began to self-actualize and come into a higher you know, form of meditation and blah, blah, blah. And I look back at that when I was 19, and I'm basically like, what an idiot. I thought I was wise, I thought I was so smart and all that, but the older I get, the more that I know, the more I begin to know that I don't know a lot. And so claiming to be wise, we as humanity instead became fools, okay? Instead of learning from God, we said, ah, I don't need God. I think I'm smarter than that, okay? I, th I can figure this out, all right? And so instead of becoming wise, we became fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they, us, worshiped idols made to look like mere bir people and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, I know that none of us, are, you know, worship uh, animals and reptiles and stuff like that. But here's the principle that I think is very important. We do worship other stuff, though. You see, when we become selfish and we move away God, we are, by nature, worshiping uh, beings. We worship something. It's just the way we are. You know, when we're honest with it, there are things in our lives that we value that if they're out of our lives, we feel a mess and we love and we cuddle them. They're our precious and things like that. And so, so it may not be birds and animals and reptiles, but here is the principle, though, I think that, that is true back then as it is today. When we are selfish and we move away from God, we will worship something, but we will worship something that is less, Okay. You know, we will begin to live for lesser things. Instead of living for all glorious, amazing creator of the universe, we will then begin to live for less stuff. Job titles, money, um, status, pleasure, things that, that ultimately don't even last. And so we begin, as we move away from God, we will live for lesser things. And you know what we do? We begin to fight against each other over lesser things. And so claiming to be wise, we become fools in that. And so, verse 24, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. When you go throughout Scripture, when you read God's movement through human history, Man, there is a place by which humans should go, oh no, this is not going to be good. And those are the moments, and you see it through human history, is when God goes, all right, go ahead, have it your way, go for it. I'm stepping back. I'm going to let you guys figure this thing out. I'm going to let you guys, you know, take this thing on. I'm moving back. I'm going to let you do that. The reason why it's so scary is because we're scary. We mess stuff up. And so God abandoned them. All right, this is what you want. If you think you're wise and you think you got this all together and you think you know what would make you happy and fulfilled, I'm going to step back. All right, go for it. And what did humans do? Well, at first they went, yeehaw, I get to do whatever I want. And so he goes on and says, as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They did whatever. Yeah. You know, the shackles are off. We can do whatever we want. Only to find out that there was a perception of what that freedom was that actually led to a, a, a slavery that enslaves us with, with fear, anxiety, anger, bitterness, hurt, uh, confusion, um, all of those things that we thought were freedom because we thought we were wise and we thought that this is what freedom means. And instead, we became foolish, and we became shackled to something that, that hurts us. And so we come to a place where we go, I need to be changed. I need transformation in my life. I bought into this thinking that this would give me the greatest joy, meaning, purpose in my life, only to find out that it's given me the greatest stress, anxiety, and even depression or even isolation. But there's another reason why we, we get stuck in our, uh, you know, in our loops, if we will. The other reason why we get, we get stuck is because we're limited. 
We're limited. What does that mean? It means we're finite. We don't know everything, okay? There's just things in life that we just don't know. And so when we try to just, you know, deal with things on our own, we're not going to deal with it well because we're all dealing with it with limited knowledge and understanding. And with our limited knowledge and understanding, we will think that we know everything, and so we'll make decisions based on our thinking that we know everything until we mess it up. And so Paul goes on in Romans 1.25, he says, So they, humanity, traded the truth about God, okay? They were in the presence with God, learning from, you know, knowing God, understanding God, and they traded in. They were transformed into listening to a liar, listening to ourselves who lie to ourselves, and listening to other people who are, who are just as confused and dysfunctional at us. And, and so... The result of that is they worshiped and served things, okay? Things God created. So we begin to worship created stuff. Money. What's money? It's created stuff. A dollar bill is only worth what we say it's worth. It's created stuff. We worship our homes. We worship our cars. It's stuff. It's created stuff. We worship human beings. They're stuff. It's people. They're created. We have been traded in worshiping a wonderful, amazing God to worship lesser things um, and, 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 and things that are created rather than who? The creator, okay, who is all-knowing, who is, who is infinite in his wisdom. And so, and so we worshiped and served the things God created and, and things we created and instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. That's why we're here. That's why we get stuck. So what's the solution to it? The solution to it is not, so what do I need to do? Or how do I overcome that? That's not the right questions. The question is, is who do I believe? Who do I listen to? Who do I go to for the what and the how? That is a more profound question because that is where the beginning steps of change happens. We're not moving so much from, you know, you know anxiety to peace. Really, it's a movement from listening to the who's over here to listening to the, the who over here. We become unstuck when we come to an unselfish, unlimited God, when we come into a relationship with him. Now, let me be very, very clear on this because this is where we get a little confused. What scripture isn't saying to us, and this is what we do because we like to always be in control, right? What, it, what, what, what this isn't saying is this. Okay, God, just give me some advice, all right? I'm going to open up the Bible, and I'm going to use the Bible in order to give me advice. But I'm still going to listen to me, my wants, my desires, my dreams, or I'm going to listen to what other people who impose themselves on me, what their hearts and their desires and dreams are for me. And so I'm going to listen to that, and I'll take what you say, and I'll incorporate, incorporate that into that. It's not what he's saying at all. Scripture is basically saying, no, 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 no. no. You, don't, you don't take advice from me. What you do is you come to me and you do this life with me and you listen to me and you allow me to love you and you are to come to me it is not about hey God what do you want me to do God how do you want me to do it that's not the first question to ask it's God who are you and how can I come into your presence and be with you now I understand that sometimes doing that is very difficult and can be very fearful. Some of the reasons why we don't change is because we, we fear. We, we fear that, you know what, I've been listening to myself and other people in my lives uh, my whole life. And so I've become very comfortable for that. To listen to God who I don't really know is very scary to me. Because what if he tells me to go do something or be something that I don't want to be? And so, because we have that fear of him, we, we don't change. Or, where we really get messed up in, is we create in our own minds who we think God is, 
and we listen to what other people say who God is, and we think about that, and we go, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. That's just kind of weird. I don't want to do that. I don't want, because that, that will take all the joy and the fun out of my life. You know, if you were to go back in time, and you were to come to me when I was 18 years old, first of all, it would take you a little while to find who I was, because I had hair back then, but once you figured out who I was, and you were to say to me, Tyler, you're going to be a pastor someday, I would have laughed at you, but then if I really thought it believed you, I probably would have gone to a corner and curled up in a ball and started crying. Because of my vision of what it meant to be a pastor or to follow God to that kind of extent, I had in my mind that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to have to sell everything and move to some really horrible land by which I'm going to be miserable all for the glory of God. All right, that's what I thought. Or I grew up in a more liturgical background, and so I was an acolyte. I you know, used to wear a, a robe to church every single Sunday and had the gloves and all that sort of stuff. And, and so I thought that if I was going to become a, a pastor or a, a priest, that meant for the rest of my life I'm going to have to wear a white dress or robe, and I'm going to have to walk around everywhere and talk like this. May God bless you, all of you. And that's kind of what I had in my mind because that's what I listened to myself. That's what I kind of observed from other people rather than just coming to God and saying, who are you? And so I had this fear factor of that. But God in his good grace over time began to really kind of show me that, hey, hey, Tyler, this is who I am. I love you. More than anything, I just want you to have a relationship with me. And I'm not here to kind of change the way that you, you know, you know you, I'm not here to change your personality or anything like that. I'm just here really, if you want to know, I'm just here to help you to change in how you love other people and to change how you gain fulfillment uh, within your own heart and life. I begin to realize that maybe God is, and following God and coming to the other side, if you will, wasn't so bad. In fact, not only is it so, not so bad, it's exhilarating, and it's freeing, and it's, and it's joyful, and it's so wonderful to be in the presence of God. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11, uh, verse 28 and 29. Then Jesus said, come to me, right? So he's saying to us, we're like over here, and he's over here. He says, come to me. Transformation is, is moving from there to moving over here. Come over to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Anybody in here dealing with weary, weariness? Anybody dealing with, with you know, heavy burdens that you're, with your life? Maybe it's physical, financial, relational. Are you dealing with that sort of stuff? Yeah, we all deal with that from time to time. And so Jesus is saying, come to me. Don't try to figure this out on your own, you know. Don't try to figure this out with other, other human beings and humanity, Come to me, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And what? I'll give you rest. Anybody want rest? That sounds nice. Rest sounds so good. But rest isn't trying to figure out the what and the how. Rest is found in, ah, oh, you like me, you accept me, you love me, even though you know everything about me. And that gives me much rest that you are in control of everything and you are sovereign God by which you give us eternal life through the shedding of your blood, Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, that gives me rest. And so Jesus is saying, come to me, I'll give you rest. But then he says something that we don't really particularly like, especially in our culture. And that is, he says the very next thing that kind of stumbles us a little bit. He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, what is a yoke? A yoke is just something that, you know, um, farmers and whatnot would, would put around cattle, uh, oxen or, or cows or whatever, in order to kind of steer and direct them. Now, we love the idea of, of freedom, okay? So when, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon me, the voice inside our head goes, oh, he's going to want to control me. He's going to make my life miserable. But guys, I just want to give some clarity and help you out here. Something controls us, every single one of us. See, the, 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 the thing about life is not trying to avoid having masters. It's finding a good one. Because we're all mastered by something. We may be yoked to our money. We may be yoked to, our, to another human being and our relationships and what they think about us. It could be something as negative as, as, as somebody who has abused us and hurt us. It could be, we could be yoked to somebody that we are just desperately in need of. So if, you know, then we'll do whatever they, they tell us to do. Uh, we are yoked to what our bosses think. We're yoked to something. We have masters. So if you're trying to live a life of freedom, 
honestly, the answer to freedom isn't so much of not having a master. You will always have a master. It's just the way we're made. The answer is, is finding a good one. Are you going to find a master over here? But there's another master who's just saying, hey, come to me. You're tired and weary, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me lead you. Will you let me lead you? And I get it. I understand that, you know, that to do that means there's trust. But in order for us to ever trust Jesus Christ, we have to build a relationship with him. We don't trust anybody we don't have a relationship with. And one of the reasons why we're stuck in our lives a lot of times is because we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ by which we're building trust. We may have an advisory relationship. Jesus kind of, what do you want me to do? How should this work? But we don't have a trusting relationship by which we just say, whatever you want, I know that you're good, I know that you're unlimited, I know that you're wise, and so I'm, I'm ready to go wherever you want me to go. Lead me on. And so Jesus says, he goes on from that, and so he kind of softens it and helps us out with that a little bit. He says, let me teach you. Because, why? Because I'm humble. Because I'm going to lead you in a way that serves you because I care about you. I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart. I care about you. I love you immensely. And you will find rest for your souls. Come and sit and do life with me. Release. Release this and come to me. I'm finding more and more in my life that there's, there's really kind of like three voices that are going on in my head. You know, one of those voices is myself, so I'm having a conversation with myself, right? So we'll talk about ourselves. The other thing is, is, is that um, the conversations that we have with other people, maybe with your boss, maybe with your spouse or with your kids or with your parents or with somebody, so those, those things just kind of rattle in your he head. But the more and more I'm, I'm beginning to realize that every time I, I listen to myself or listen to the conversations I have in my head, it usually doesn't lead to rest or gentleness or the lifting of heavy burdens. But I'm finding that when I let go of those voices of having the authority in my life and moving over into that relationship with Jesus where I just say, teach me. I wanna listen to what you have to say about me. I don't, I, I don't care what I think about me. I really don't care about what other people think about me. I, I wanna know what you think about me. And I, I want you to know, you know how much you love me. And, and I wanna know what you think. I wanna know who you are. I want you to tell me who you are. I don't care about what I think who, of who you are. I don't really think, care so much about what other people think about who you are. I just wanna know who you are. You know, so it's that moving over to that other side to where we just say to, to Jesus Christ, teach me, I'm teachable. I know that you're good and that you love me. And that's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. In other words, stop listening to this. Come to the other side. Break on through to the other side, all right? And come over here. And he says, let God, the who? It's the who again. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. I love this verse because in some ways, it's, it's, it's like Paul, it's like a challenge for Paul. Paul basically says, you know what? If Paul were a gambling man, this is kind of what he would say. I bet that if you stop listening to the voices of this world, because it's very hard to listen to the voice of heaven when you're too busy listening to the voice of the earth. But I bet that if you gave God a shot and you came on over to the other side and just said, I just want to listen to you, and I just want to do life with you, Paul basically says this, I bet, not only do I bet, but I know that when you come over here, you're going to go, oh, you are good. You are gentle. You are humble. You do want the best for me. Even when you ask me to do really hard stuff that makes me shake in my boots. But I see that when you ask me to do those things and I follow you and do it with you and allow you to deal with the outcomes of that as the sovereign God of the universe who knows all things. Yeah, you're pretty smart. You kind of know what you're doing. Man. And all I had to do was just go, okay. 
I love that. I think of Moses. You know, when Moses, when, when, when God came to Moses, Moses tried to get out of going to Egypt. But, but I can't, can't speak. I can't, I can't do this. No, no, I don't want to do this. You know, and then he finally said, okay, fine. I'll come to the other side and I'll just trust you. And I love that because I'm always thinking about the genius of Moses. You know why Jesus, Moses was the most amazing person? You know, you know why he was so amazing? Because God said, hey, Moses, raise the staff. And Moses went, I trust you. Okay. And he's a genius. And he saves the people. When we recognize that all God wants us to do is to come in his presence, to trust him, to do life with him, and to step out and allow him to do whatever he does best, man, guess what happens? Transformation. Change. It's an amazing, wonderful, beautiful thing. But it's not about, it's not about beginning with the what. It's not about beginning with the, with the how. It's beginning with the who. And so, I love this, just these last words here from David, because I think it's so good. It's, David said this in, in Psalm 910. And this is, I love this because it's, 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 it's as if he's writing this for, for future generations and writing for people to kind of get this and, and basically say, hey guys, this is my personal experience of coming to the other side. And my personal experience of coming to the other side, I think David would say is this, God, those who know your name, what does that mean? That means those who really know you, not know about you, not that they know a bunch of Bible verses, but they really know you because they spend time with you and they like you and, and they want to do life with you and they're beginning to trust you. And those who know your name, what do they do? They trust in you. David says, man, when I look at people who do life with God and allow God to direct their lives, they trust him because they see that he's good and they see that he's wise and that he see, he's knowledgeable. For you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. As we come into this time of communion, I think it's important for us to know the name of Jesus. To know the name of Jesus is to know that God loves you so much that he understands that we are selfish, he understands that we are limited, he understands that we make a mess of stuff, but in his great love for you and me and us, he came into this world to die for us, to take the bullet for us, because he will do anything to bring us from here to bring us into his presence. And so as we, in a moment here, take the time to move out, and just take the, the, the bread which symbolizes his body given for you because he loves you. And the cup, which is, you know, the juice which is symbolic of, of his blood which is shed for you. He did that because one, he's unselfish and that he loves you. And he did it because he is, he is eternal. And he desires for us in accepting that beautiful gift to be with him forever. Here's the deal, guys. Right now, in all reality, you're as close to God as you want to be. Because he's right here. It's right here. You're as close to him as you want to be. It's your move. You can stay over here listening to your voice, listening to the voices of others? Or are you going to come to the other side? You know, it's not about time, because time is now to make that decision, to move across, to begin to know his name, and to know through that that he's trustworthy. And then through that, to begin to desire to live your life with him. And then through that, begin to see him change your life life. Heavenly Father, I'm just incredibly grateful that you just didn't leave us abandoned to try to figure this thing out on our own. By your justice and your might, you could have done that. It was all in your right to do so. But in your grace and your love for us, you humbled yourself and became a slave, a slave to death, even a criminal's death because you will do anything for us 
to move us back into your presence, to move us from one side to the other for our lives to be changed, changed in the way that we, our heart beats for you and our heart beats for other people and how that just maneuvers and changes our life. Thank you so much for that. As we take this time and just take some communion, Lord, we're gonna take it to draw near to you, to come, to come. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would stir within our hearts to come. It's in your son's name I pray.